Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the course on multivariate data mining methods and applications. This is the first lecture of the course and this lecture is just an introductory lecture. So, in this lecture we are going to discuss why we require this course or the basic objective of the course. Then we will also discuss the areas in which this course may be applicable. All the students of the subjects or the areas for which this course may be essential or may be of use. I will also give you the basic outline of the course and then I will give you some idea of the prerequisites which are required for this course. And then just a few recommendations of books for reading which may help you in following this course. Nowadays, we get a lot of data in various fields. Whether you consider marketing or financial area, you have financial time series or in economics, in different government departments, in environmental sciences in bioinformatics or biological sciences or even in medical field. And then there are many more other areas also where we are interested in collecting data. And then our decisions are based on the inferences drawn from the data. So, the collected data help you in making different decisions, different policy decisions or making different inferences. And in various fields, we are having huge data. We get large amount of data. One can say that Today is the era of data. However, as such, you will not be able to draw any inferences from the data. You will not be able to make any decisions on the basis of the data. Or you can say that data do not speak by itself. You require certain tools for making inferences, for making decisions on the basis of data. Then definitely you require some methods which can handle these data, which can extract information from the data whether those tools come from statistics or data sciences or exploratory data analysis or data mining. Now, in past it was not possible to collect or analyze big data. If you have high frequency data 
or if you have observations on a very large number of variables and a large number of observations also on a large number of variables. Then using the classical statistical tools, it was not possible for you to draw any inferences. In fact, it was not possible to use all those classical inference procedures for analyzing the big data. So, you require some modifications. In fact, most of the statistical procedures or most of the statistical tools are meant for a small or medium size data. The data mining provides you a way out for analyzing the big data set. You can observe the pattern of the data, you can make inferences about the data, say you can segment the data into different classes, you can make predictions or you can fit some model and then make predictions using big data if you are using different data mining tools. Actually, the basic objective of different data mining tools is to provide such kind of inferences to recognize the patterns present in the data, some hidden patterns present in the data or if the relationships between different variables is quite complex, then to develop models for the data or to make inferences about the relationships between variables from the information provided by the data. And once you are able to develop some model, then you can make predictions also on the basis of big data. And these kind of predictions help you in making different decisions. Then suppose you have big data in any field, then sometimes you may be interested in the segmentation of the data. You want to obtain different groups, different clusters, so that the observations belonging to a particular cluster are most similar to each other. So, for all these purposes, one can make use of different data mining tools. Now, interesting thing is that we get data in different fields and then obviously the objectives of analyzing data or the kind of inferences which one wants to draw from the data in different fields are different, but essentially we use the same set of tools for analyzing the data in different fields. The same set of tools provided by statistics or data mining. So, even if people are working in different fields, knowledge of such kind of data mining tools is essential for all those people. Whether you are handling data in finance or you want to analyze different economic variables on the basis of past data on those variables or you have marketing data, say e-marketing or data from some departmental stores or you have data in the medical field, 
or one field in which data mining is quite frequently used is bioinformatics. In all these fields for analyzing the data, you need knowledge of data mining tools. So, data mining is an essential part of all these fields. So, this course is aimed at developing skills for data analysis, machine learning and statistical modeling. Of course, this course is useful for all those who are working in different areas and are interested in analyzing big data. And for that purpose, they are using data mining tools. Now, the scale and scope of data collection is increasing in all fields. During the past decade, there is a drastic change in the performance of computers. The memory of computers is increasing say multiple times. The computation power is also increasing multiple times. So, now it is possible to store big size data. Earlier it was not possible. Further, with growing computation power of the computers, it is possible to do complicated computations. Earlier it used to take a very long time even for doing very small computations, say even for evaluating a complicated integral etcetera. But now the powers of computers has increased the computation power of the computers. So, we can even analyze very large size data very fast provided you are using a proper algorithm. So, in this sense the scale of computation is increasing very fast. Then since we can store big data and it is possible to analyze big data very fast, even the scope is also increasing very fast. Means since we can make inferences, we can draw information from the big data very fast, then why do not we utilize this power of computers for drawing inferences? Say whether you are working in industries or whether you are handling very big data in bioinformatics or whether you are handling big data in financial market, in stock market etcetera. Since now it is possible for you to store such kind of data and then it is also possible for you to do complicated computations to handle the complicated relationships between the data very fast. So, why do not we use this kind of advantage for our benefit. So, the scope is also increasing. Now, statistical learning is a set of tools to explore and understand complex data set. So, drawing inferences from the complex data sets or getting information from the complex data sets is a part of statistical learning. Statistical learning provides you a set of tools 
and uh, statistical learning actually deals with the statistical inference problem of finding a predictive function based on data. So, you have data and then you make use of different statistical procedures and uh, then you find some predictive function or you inferences from the data. Then uh, statistical learning theory, it has been uh, successfully applied to different fields of science and then it has been applied to finance also, industries, computer vision, even for speech recognition and in bioinformatics. So, statistical learning actually involves all the problems or all the tools which can draw information from the data. Now, here are some examples of the learning problems. Predict if a patient having a heart attack will have a second heart attack on the basis of some, some clinical test measurements. So, suppose you are dealing with heart patient and uh, the patient has a past history of heart attack and then you go for some clinical tests which are relevant for the heart patients and then on the basis of those measurements of the clinical tests, your objective is to predict whether the patient can have second heart attack in near future or not. You have to take care of that patient accordingly and you have also to decide the medicine plan for the patient accordingly or predict the glucose level in the blood of a diabetic patient using infrared absorption spectrum of blood sample. So, you have infrared absorption spectrum of the blood sample and then you have to draw information about the glucose level or you have to predict the glucose level in the blood of the patient or you have to predict the price of a stock after 3 months on the basis of company performance measures and past price data. So, suppose you have information about the company's past performance measures, say the how much asset the company has or the past stock prices and then on the basis of past performance measures and past prices, these are the input variables actually. You want to predict the price of a stock after 3 months. So, basically you would like to develop some kind of a statistical model between the stock price and the company performance measures and past price data. And once you can develop a model between these input and output variables, you can predict the future stock market price for the company or identify the risk factors of breast cancer using clinical and demographic variables. So, suppose for a set of females, you have data on different clinical tests or even for some demographic variables. Then using that data, you may like to predict the risk factors for breast cancer. Say suppose for the past data, you have the information on clinical test results and demographic variables as well as the person 
has breast cancer or not. And then you develop some model, some statistical model. Now, for any future patient means for the new patient, suppose you have the information on the clinical tests and demographic variables, then you can predict the risk factors for breast cancer. Now, we come to the exploratory data analysis. Usually, exploratory data analysis is the first step for analyzing the data. Exploratory data analysis may be viewed as a collection of a small sample data analytic tools. So, usually in exploratory data analysis, we handle a small sample and then it is centered around quick methods for visualization and examination of small data sets. So, basically in exploratory data analysis, you do not go for drawing deep inferences. You just focus on some quick methods of data visualization and then you also try to examine the basic features of the data like its mean, its variance, its uh, coefficient of skewness or kurtosis or the, the form of the distribution of the data set etcetera. And then it helps you in moving further in the sense that for deeper analysis of the data, what kind of tools are required or what kind of tools one may use. Now, recent trend is there is enormous increase in data storage capability and computational power for relatively low cost. So, this point actually I have already mentioned that during last few years or you can say during last one decade, the data is storage capability has enormously increased and the computational power of the computers has also increased manifold. And uh, you can do data storage as well as computation for relatively low cost. So, it is not very expensive. Then you also have measurements on a large number of related variables and then these produce a moderate to large data set. So, suppose uh, you consider data set in marketing or data set which you get from different stores of uh, say the lines. Now, there are a lot of products which the customers purchase, a lot of products are available. So, number of variables is very large. Then the number of customers who visit different stores is also very large. So, you have a large number of related variables and then the sample size, the number of observations is also very large. So, you have big data. Here are many examples of big data. Say billions of transactions each year are carried out by international finance companies. So, if you consider any international finance company and if you look at their transactions each year, then billions of transactions are carried out. Even if you look at any bank, whether national or international, it has several branches all over the country or all over the world 
and then if you look at the number of transactions, then it is huge. Internet traffic data, naturally the data size is very large if you consider internet traffic data. Then human genome project has to deal with gigabytes of genetic information. So, you have a very large number of genes on which you get information and then the number of observations is also very large. In astronomy or space sciences or in earth sciences, you get terabytes and pentabytes of data for processing. So, you get big size data or if you consider remote sensing satellite systems data, they collect many gigabytes of data each hour. So, again you have big data. Then the data collected by governmental statistical agencies say they collect greater amounts of detailed economic, labor, demographic and census information then in the past it was not possible for the government agencies who deal with the, the statistics or who collect data to get such a greater amount of detailed information. Now, you have a big data which the government agencies collect. Then you have massive data sets on crime, health care etcetera and these data are maintained by different government agencies and naturally one would like to draw information from the data, otherwise this data is of no use. So, one would like to have proper data analysis tools. Now, each of these data sets is incredibly large and complex with millions of observations being recorded to huge number of variables. So, you have a very large number of variables as well as a very large number of observations. So, the data is very large and it is very complex also and naturally to get information from such kind of big data is not so easy. In fact, most of the classical statistical tools fail to handle these kind of big data. So, the data sets of interest are so large and then these data set led to the creation of data mining techniques. So, different data mining techniques are developed keeping in view to draw information from the big data. Even for huge amount of data and the entire population of data values is readily available. If the problem is simple enough, we can sample and use standard exploratory and confirmatory methods. So, this is one option. Obviously, if you have large number of observations as well as large number of variables, then as a classical statistician, a simple question arises in your mind, why do not we go for different sampling methods? Different sampling methods are developed keeping in view that you have a very large population and then for drawing inferences about different features of the population you draw a random sample and then on the basis of random sample you generalize it 
for the population or you make inferences about the population. Of course, in some of the circumstances sampling may be used, it may provide appropriate solution. It may be considered as an supplement to detailed data exploration activities, but not in all the situations. Now, often the question asked about the data set are exploratory in nature and do not involve inference. Say, suppose you want to estimate the mean of the population or you want to draw some other kind of inferences about the population. Say, you want to obtain the variance. Then you can go for sampling. Your objective is to draw inference about the entire population and then you may consider your sample as a proper representative of the population. And then on the basis of sample, you draw the inference and you generalize your result for the entire population. Just uh, assuming that your sample is a proper representative of the population. So, ultimately it depends upon what kind of problem you are handling or what kind of question has been asked. If you are interested in uh, exploring such kind of properties of the population, then you can go for sampling. But does sampling work with exploring a data pattern such as to find outliers, data errors or hidden trends, identifying genes expressing differently or credit cards and bank related frauds etc. So, sometimes you are interested in getting the information which involves say some outlier. For example, in gene expression data, you have big size data, a very large number of genes and then you have observation on the expression values of the genes and you just want to know which particular genes are responsible for a particular disease like say breast cancer or changes in expression values of which genes is responsible for breast cancer. Of course, you have a very large number of genes and you have observations on the expression values for all those genes for different patients. And there are a very few genes which are responsible for that particular type of cancer that is breast cancer. And you have to identify those genes. Now, suppose you go for sampling, then you may lose information about those particular genes which are responsible for breast cancer. Those genes or expression values of those genes may not be the part of your sample. So, your purpose will be defeated. You will not be able to identify the genes responsible for breast cancer. 
similarly for credit cards and bank related frauds say you are observing the behavior of a large number of individuals who are using credit cards by the large and then the credit cards which are used for some fraud are very few and just on the basis of transactions or other behaviors of the customers of credit cards you have to identify those few credit cards on using which some fraud is going on now such kind of customers or such kind of credit card customers are outliers their behavior is not normal and you have to identify those outliers again you have big data you have a very huge number of customers and suppose you opt for sampling then in sampling information about those customers may be lost those customers may not be the part of the sample who are involved in some kind of fraud so again your purpose will be defeated you are not interested in observing the general behavior of the entire population you are basically interested in outliers very few customers who are behaving differently very few genes which are behaving differently so in such problems or to answer such kind of questions you cannot go for sampling sampling won't serve your purpose so definitely you have to analyze the entire data set so such kind of phenomena are local phenomena possibly affecting only a few observations and then sampling may completely miss the specifics of patterns of special interest say so you are interested in observing some pattern of the customers of credit card who do fraud or patterns of the genes or the expression values of the genes which are behaving differently and in case of sampling you completely missed these specific of patterns which are of your interest then why we need data mining course most of the questions asked of large data sets are different from the classical inference questions asked of, of much smaller samples of data say in classical inference you are interested in observing the main features of the population say its mean its variance or the its probability distribution whether the probability distribution is uh, skewed or not it is symmetric etc so the questions are asked of much smaller samples of data but for large data sets your questions asked are different say so you are interested in the outliers so the example which we have discussed about the gene expression data or credit card fraud data these are local phenomena so your question involves local phenomena then the objective of data mining 
is to extract valuable insights and knowledge from large and complex data sets. Even if you have to develop some model, but the relationship is complex because the data set is very large and it is very complex in nature. You will not be able to use classical inference procedures. So, you require some data mining tools. Then data mining also helps you to uncover hidden patterns or for predictive modeling or for data segmentation. You want data segmentation or clustering. You want to cluster the data into homogeneous groups. The units belonging to a particular cluster follow similar kind of pattern or fraud detection which involves identifying the outliers. So, the data mining tools are basically different from the classical statistical analysis and for analyzing big data or for drawing this kind of information from the data, you would not be able to make use of classical statistical analysis. So, you require different tools which are data mining tools. Now, this course is suitable for students and researchers of various fields. Obviously, since you are interested in drawing inferences or drawing information from the data and if you are handling data, you would not be able to avoid statistics or statisticians. So, it is quite useful for statisticians or the statistics students and in machine learning also. Basically, we use different data mining tools. So, for the researchers and the students of machine learning, this course is useful. In financial management, often you have to handle big data. So, the course is useful for the students or researchers or even for applied workers of financial management. And of course, for data sciences or data scientists, this course is quite useful. In fact, in fact, the data sciences also involves making inferences or drawing information from the data. So, it is useful for data science students. In bioinformatics, different data mining tools are quite frequently used. Say, often you have to identify genes which are responsible for certain kind of disease. So, you have gene expression data, then you have to identify the genes which are responsible for the disease. And then you can use different data mining tools or in bioinformatics, often you have to segment data or you have to divide data into different clusters and uh, the data points of different clusters or the genes belonging to different clusters are behaving more or less similarly or following the similar kind of pattern. So, in bioinformatics also data mining is quite useful and it is suitable for the students and researchers of bioinformatics. In cognitive science, different data mining tools are used. So, it is useful for the students of or researchers of cognitive science and it is also useful for the 
the students and researchers of psychology. Not only these fields, there are several other fields also, where you have to handle big data or data involving large number of variables and large number of individuals on which you are collecting the data. The data mining is also useful. Now, here are the prerequisites for the course. Of course, uh, since in data mining, we use different results of the probability theory or different terms or different results of statistics, different uh, inference or estimation procedures like maximum likelihood, etcetera of statistics. So, basic knowledge of probability theory and statistics is essential. Then in data mining, you have to handle multivariate data. Say you have a number of variables and on each variable, you are taking observations on a number of units. So, you have multivariate data and while analyzing this multivariate data, if you are using the matrix algebra tools, then your life becomes easier. Then you can easily handle the multivariate data. So, definitely basic knowledge of matrix algebra is required. In this course, I have covered some of the essential or some of the required results of matrix algebra, but of course, uh, due to limitation of time, it was not possible for me to go into much detail. So, it is better if you have some basic knowledge of matrix algebra. Then multivariate analysis. So, definitely you have multivariate data and for analyzing multivariate data, you require different tools of the multivariate analysis. So, you must have the knowledge of multivariate normal distribution or different uh, properties of the multivariate normal distribution or the different results of the multivariate analysis. Again, in one of the lecture, in brief, I have discussed the essential components of multivariate analysis, but again, it was not possible for me to go into much detail. So, I have discussed most of the results without giving proof. Then some basic knowledge of R software or some other software like Python may help you. Now, this is the course outline. The course is of 40 hours, means we have 40 lectures, each lecture of 1 hour. And uh, of course, this first lecture is introductory lecture and in the second and third lecture, we are going to discuss the basics of data mining. In brief, I will discuss the machine learning and artificial intelligence also. I will not go into much detail when we discuss machine learning and artificial intelligence, just I will give you a brief idea. Then as I mentioned earlier, for this data mining course, some basic knowledge of matrix algebra and multivariate analysis is essential. So, in lectures 4 and 5, just in brief, we have discussed matrix algebra and multivariate analysis. Of course, most of the results which are required in subsequent lectures are given without proof. 
But if you are interested in proofs of those results, you may consult some matrix algebra and multivariate analysis book. In lectures from 6 to 12, we are going to handle multiple regression model and we will also consider regression models for classification. We will discuss the estimation procedure for multiple regression model, model selection criterion, then different problems which we may face while handling the multiple regression model like multicollinearity problem, then how to resolve multicollinearity problem, etcetera. And then one can use regression models for classification purpose also. So, we have discussed uh, the regression models for classification like log it and probit models and then how to estimate those models in practice. In lectures 13 to 17, we have focused on principal component analysis. Actually, in data mining or while handling big data, often we have to deal with high dimensional data. And uh, sometimes, although the dimension of the data is high, but the observations are concentrated around a low dimensional space. So, the basic objective of principal component analysis is to reduce the dimension of the data without losing much information available in the data. So, in these lectures, we have discussed principal component analysis, linear principal component analysis as well as non-linear principal component analysis when the observations are concentrated around some non-linear feature space. In lectures 18 and 19, we discuss the problem of blind soul separation. Then uh, we will also discuss the factor analysis which is helpful in blind source separation. In lectures 20 to 26, we are going to discuss artificial neural network and uh, we will also discuss the convolution neural network as well as the current neural network. And in these lectures, we will discuss uh, single layer perceptron, multi layer perceptron etcetera and then how to train all these artificial neural networks. In lectures 27 to 32, we are going to discuss the cluster analysis including the self organizing map. The basic objective of cluster to classify the observations in clusters so that the observations in the cluster are behaving more or, or follow the similar kind of pattern. Then and 38, we will discuss support which is also a machine learning tool. We will discuss uh, when, when we have multiple classes, when boundaries to classify the or when we have non-linear boundaries, etc. And in lectures 30, we will discuss block clustering and by clustering, we classify the observations to variables as well as according. So, this is two directional clustering. Now, these are the recommended readings. And, uh, 
for most of the lectures, I am going by Eisenman, the modern multivariate and uh, this book at all for cluster analysis in part I will follow this book by Averitt. Uh, for some chapters I have consulted by Hahn and Campbell and by Dunham. For most of the lectures, I have followed the Eisenman book. So, I hope that you will enjoy this course. Thank you very much. Shikha Dikshit. I teach psychology and I am with the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Kanpur. Today I am going to talk about what is social cognition. Social cognition is a research area in psychology which explicates the various cognitive processes that people employ to understand the social world. So, essentially it is about sense making of the social world which involves understanding other people as well as understanding oneself. Understanding others requires understanding their traits, their internal tendencies, their contextual aspects, motives, feelings, emotions, etc. So, as we can see, uh, this is a very complex process and requires a massive amount of information processing. Even for small decisions, for simple decisions, people have to process a large amount of information. The main uh, perspective or the approach which is used in social cognition is obviously the cognitive approach and which is the study of mental structures and processes. The main paradigm which is used is the information processing paradigm. As far as the range of topics in social con uh, cognition is concerned, the range is very wide from individual level sense making to collective sense making. As far as views of cognitive sense making are concerned, there are three major dominant views in social cognition, the naive scientist view, the cognitive miser view and the motivated tactician view. The naive scientist view emerged from research done in causal attribution and this refers to detailed and systematic processing of information and sense making in the social world. However, it is not always, it is not always possible to make detailed uh, cognitive, to engage in detailed cognitive processing and hence people act as cognitive misers in many situations. So, whenever there is lack of time and cognitive effort is less, then people involve in uh, using certain strategies which, which are functional yet they are like mental shortcuts. So, this is the cognitive miser approach. However, the question that comes to the fore is that which one of the two strategies is more important? The answer is provided by the motivated tactician view. And according to this view, people can either use the naive scientist approach or the cognitive miser approach as and when required and they can switch over between the two approaches when required. So, these are the three major views which are utilized to understand cognitive sense making. The topics that uh, co social cognition covers uh, ranges from uh, cognitive social cognition to social social cognition. So, topics such as causal attribution, understanding of attitudes, social schemas, unconscious 
cognition about social situations, the use of mental shortcuts or heuristics in decision making, social, uh, social identity and stereotypings, uh, stereotyping processes are some of the topics. In addition to this, a large number of social cognitive psychologists also understand collective sense making in terms of social representations.